Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. These are my uh, disclosures. So, uh, the OAB and BPH symptoms are uh, frequently reported together. The limited data are available on the efficacy and safety of OAB medications for treating patients with a combination of low urinary tract symptoms, both storage and voiding. The PLUS study is a 12-week phase four randomized double-blind multi-center trial conducted in 80 sites across North America and Europe. Meribegron versus placebo for treating OAB symptoms in men receiving tamsulosin for LUTs uh, due to overlying, underlying BPH. So it was a comparison, double-blind randomized trial of Meribegron plus placebo uh, versus uh, tamsulosin plus Meribegron. The objective of, uh, sorry, it's tamsulosin plus placebo or tamsulosin plus Meribegron. The objective uh, of this presentation is to describe the safety and tolerability findings from the study. Uh, the study is being reported and was presented elsewhere. Looking at treatment emergence adverse events, uh, all of them, and also of special interest, and those include uh, changes in PVR volume and Qmax, and home and office-based vital signs, and 12 lead ECGs. This is the study design. Men uh, 40 or more who had been receiving tamsulosin for at least two months for LUTs uh, due to BPH in the opinion of the investigator. There was a run-in period of tamsulosin uh, once daily, and they were randomized uh, with a three-day uh, electronic diary, and they had to have eight or more micturitions per day, two or more urgency episodes of concern, and it was graded, and a PSA less than 10. They were randomized to tamsulosin plus placebo or tamsulosin plus 25 mil mil uh, milligrams of mirabegron for four weeks, and it was dose escalated to 50 milligrams. That was done because uh, those are the requirements in North America regarding dosing of, temps of mirabegron. The PLUS study, met its primary efficacy endpoint, which is change from baseline to end of treatment in mean number of micturitions per day, and it was superior to tamsulosin in the uh, number of micturitions per day. It was statistically superior. Uh, both treatments were well tolerated, and this uh, look at the data uh, includes a detailed analysis of the safety. There were a total of 706 men uh, the mean age was 65, plus or minus 8.9 years. Uh, more than 56% of them were 65 or over uh, in uh, the group, and 92% uh, were white, as one sees in clinical trials. The most common comorbidity was hypertension, which in the placebo group was 59%. In the treatment group, tansilosin plus mirabegron was 55%, that is, patients going into the study. The overall number of treatment emergent adverse events, uh, it was higher, it was 31.4% in the placebo group uh, versus 26% in the treatment group. Drug-related uh, adverse events was a little higher, 12% in the treatment group versus 6% uh, in the uh, placebo group. Uh, treatment events, uh, emergent adverse events leading to study discontinuation uh, was a little bit higher, 2% uh, in the treatment versus 1% in the placebo group. Most of the uh, TEAEs were mild in 61% or moderate in 33% uh, uh, in patients in the study. The most common reported uh, treatment of emergent adverse events was hypertension. Uh, there were 3% uh, in the, in the uh, placebo group and 1.7% in the treatment group. That's new onset hypertension, so a very low rate. Uh, headache, uh, about 2%, 2.3% uh, in the placebo versus 1.7% in the treatment. Nasopharyngitis, which you expect with tamsulosin, as you know, uh, occasionally. So it's about 2%, 1.7% uh, in the placebo and 2% in the treatment group. Urinary retention was the only treatment emergent adverse event of special interest reported by one or more percent in all the groups. There were two tamsulosin plus mirabegron required catheterization. Neither event led to study discontinuation. 
One catheterization was actually secondary to an operation that the patient had had following the treatment end. No cases of BPO requiring surgery was reported. Looking at the specific uh, vital signs, uh, QTC prolongation was not significantly different among the group, uh, between the groups, and it was not of concern. Pulse rates, similarly, there were no signals, and both systolic and diastolic blood pressure was not appreciably elevated across the groups. PVR volume uh, increased uh, by about 15 cc's average in the treatment group and about three cc's in the placebo group. Qmax likewise deteriorated uh, by under two cc's per second uh, in the treatment versus almost nothing in the uh, placebo group. So overall, Mirabegron add-on treatment was well tolerated. Treatment emergent adverse events uh, were consistent with the known safety profile for Mirabegron. No clinically meaningful changes from baseline uh, were uh, from in vital signs were measured, and no clinically relevant changes in PVR volume and Qmax uh, were seen as well. So there are no unexpected safety concerns uh, in this study, uh, with which involved the addition of mirabegron to tamsulosin. The authors would like to thank the PLUS study investigators and all patients who took part. The study was funded by Astellas. Medical writing support was provided by Michael Parsons and uh, Elevate Scientific Solutions and funded by Astellas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, any questions? Paul. Um, Abrams, Bristol. So, um, I'm interested in this being tamsulosin for underlying BPH. We don't usually treat histology, do we? BPH is a term for histology. That's all it is. And it's not clear from this presentation whether any of these patients actually had benign prostatic obstruction, which the AUA guidelines say is the aim of treatment in these men. They specifically say the aim of treatment is not to BPH. That's in the AUA guidelines, written by Kevin McCarry, uh, McVarry, um, along with other very notable colleagues. So this is a confusing paper. Do you have any evidence that these men had BPH? Because they presumably didn't have biopsies. Do you have any evidence that they had BPO? Actually, that question uh, is being answered currently on the basis of reviews from the PLUS study. But I must remind you, Paul, that this paper is just on the treatment of emergent adverse events. It's not on the study design nor the rationale behind the study. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're correct. And the committee has agonized and, and debated this whole term. And actually, the bottom line was uh, essentially, which is not related to my presentation today, is that it's the concept of men with lower urinary tract symptoms who are diagnosed by their urologist to have lower urinary tract symptoms on the basis of their prostate, even though, and they're treated with tamsulosin and residual or uh, concomitant OAB symptoms that are ongoing can be treated safely and effectively to some degree with Mirbegron. So it was just to convey the information about this treatment, patient treatment group. And yes, there's a terminology issue, the diagnosis issue. We are, we're grappling with those questions. Uh, can I say that there are some very important members of ICS here on the scientific committee, et cetera, et cetera. There are five papers in this session which refer to BPH. I said it was the AUA accepted nomenclature. It's been the ICS accepted nomenclature since 2002. Isn't it about time that uh, presenters were asked to standardize their nomenclature and use meaningful terms? BPH is utterly misleading. BPH has exactly the same prevalence of age. So if you're over 80, you have an 80% chance of having BPH. Of course, you don't have an 80% chance of having prostatic obstruction, much, much less. So this term is meaningless. And I would say that your commercial sponsorship may well be the reason. Now, I don't attribute blame to Estellas. Their problem is that the FDA, which is a very old thinking organization, still use the term BPH and recognize drug use mm. for BPH. And this is wrong. And it's about time colleagues like you who are very senior say to the FDA, no, this is wrong. 
The nomenclature by all the scientific societies say you use the term BPO if you're aiming to alleviate obstruction. You use BPH if you've got histology. All the scientific studies say that. What do you think? Do you have a responsibility to challenge the FDA in this? Uh, if, if I were an American citizen, I'd feel that responsibility. Okay, well, is Kaplan here? <laughs> I think, I mean, it's a really meaningful discussion, but I think we need to uh, head on to the next, otherwise the other two presenters will have no time for their presentation. Thank you. So thank you.